themselves, building conversations, and we are an augmented reality design visualization company. Um, so everyone realizes the, the, well, the, the fundamental communication problem between designers and their clients. Um, the revolution decades ago in architecture was AutoCAD. So going from literally blueprints, 2D, into 3D was nothing less than a revolution, all right? But unfortunately, the, the one thing that was never improved upon, and still is no better today than it was back then, was actually how to communicate those designs, the actual communication between people. Uh, it's always out of context. Um, the abstraction of dealing with looking at a computer monitor or even a model, 3D model on a desk, you're not in context, you're not on site. So if anyone has ever built a home, built an addition onto their house, uh, try to place a well on their property, something's always off. It's always dissatisfaction at the end of the process. What we do is we present the finished, full-size architecture up front at the beginning of the process. So that's the problem. The problem is the communication and clarity, and it wastes time and money. That's the problem that we're solving. So the solution is this. So we're an iPad-based mobile solution. So you go out on site, where the building is proposed to be, you're not in an office looking at a blueprint or a CAD model on a, on a monitor. You hold up your iPad on site and you see this. You see your finished home, full size, in place, the right scale, and you can physically walk up to the shingles and look at the wood grain. You can step into, as long as there's not a wall between you and it, you can step into the virtual living room, turn around, look out of your virtual windows at the real world, all registered properly, and go, oh no, I can see my, my neighbor made with bedroom window from my kitchen, I don't want that. So let's rotate the whole house plan two degrees, or move the bay window six feet to the left, right? To do this at the very beginning of the process, not 18 months later. And we've got a, a number of different viewing modes to help, uh, help make this possible. The augmented reality mode is, as I say, you can step into the building, you can walk around it. It stays perfectly geolocated in the real world. We also have what we euphemistically call a hologram mode. So many times during the process of designing homes, and this is applicable, I'll, I'll talk about in a minute with our, our client base. Downtown urban development for billion dollar skyscrapers are some of our clients, uh, as well as private home design. Instead of spending several thousand dollars on a balsa wood tabletop model that takes two weeks to make and you throw away five minutes after you see that's not right, you just project the existing designs that you've already got on the computer on the desktop. And again, you just hold this like this and you see it on the desktop and you walk around and you look at it like this and it looks great. And you can toggle through data-driven options. I like a chimney here, I like the chimney there, I like wood grain, I like bricks. So. Here. So the, the team, I'll, uh, I'll do the team right after this. Uh, actually, the, the market, we're targeting architectural design initially because they came to us. My partner, who I'll talk about, George Thrush, lifetime architect. Um, so all of our paying clients now, and we've been beta testing for about uh, two years, we started converting our uh, beta clients, and we've got 100% conversion rate so far. The first six that we've asked said, yes, please. Um, these are them here in town, so again, they do everything from giant skyscrapers to uh, high-end luxury homes in the Martha's Vineyard and, the, and Falmouth, the hospital complexes in Beijing, downtown Boston, uh, multi-family units, lots of different use cases. One minute. One minute. Um, so the team, very quickly, so I've, in 25 years, I've built and led creative technical teams for George Lucas flying the Millennium Falcon in Star Wars. I started South Park, wrote the book in computer graphics. George Thrush, I mentioned my, my partner's the architect, Mark Sivak. Uh, Bill Polson's in the audience. He just retired from 20 years at uh, Pixar. He's our next generation quality and pipeline guy. We've got a world-class team. That's really absolutely critical. Um, so we've been bootstrapping up to now. I've got about $30,000 of my own money in it. We went through the Idea Venture Accelerator at Northeastern University, and then we were a Mass Challenge finalist this year. We just finished up. We're one of the 128 companies that was picked out of the 2000 or so. Um, and we're, so we're looking for our very first angel seed fund round right now. Let's say how much, right? Can't do that. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, we're looking for profitability in about two years. We've got scale. We price, uh, it's a B2B software as a service model. So we have a monthly subscription model that scales to enterprise. 
And that was my last word. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Nicely done. Thank you. Presentation. Um, Thank you. Talk to us briefly about uh, competition. Competition, yes. So um, many people say, oh, aren't there dozens of companies out there doing this already? We've seen the billions of dollars being poured into Magic Leap and Microsoft HoloLens and Google Glass came and went. Lots of Oculus Rift, the VR side of that. But when you drill down to it, uh, and I'm happy to follow up later uh, with a schematic, they're all either in the hardware platform market or they're in a general kind of marketing business uh, across lots of different sectors. So what we're doing is we're really hyper-focusing on a geolocated, location-based real estate architecture market that no one else is doing, literally. We had one potential competitor, they just pivoted to indoor furniture placement to try to talk to like Ikea and those kind of people. So, um, so the reality is it's a huge market. The reason why we're looking for funding now is for time to market. That's our biggest risk is that we will have competitors that are, that are coming up behind us. So right now we're in a really good spot. That's what we're going to spend the funds on, is building the team and repeating our, our paying customer go-to-market. We have several questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Several questions for you. Uh, your exit is uh, by acquisition. Can you give me the top two people who would be potential acquisitors? Autodesk or Onshape. So Autodesk is the obvious one. I've been a user of their products for about 25 years. We know all their senior executives very well. They were mentors to us to Mass Challenge. Um, they have a corporate um, policy of acquisition, as you probably know. They buy two companies like us about every month. Um, Onshape, you met John Hirschkick. He uh, developed SolidWorks for SO Systems, who we're also talking to. Um, so th those are the likely acquisition plans. With, in terms of competition, what unfair competitive advantage do you have in this patent protection? Uh, the team and yes. We have a, a, a patent, a provisional patent filed on the uh, location-based augmented reality for architecture. That's is that a process one or is it? Design patent. Design. Yeah. And really, honestly, the team, I'm really, really fortunate and lucky to have the team that I do. I, I would have taken the whole five minutes just to talk about the team uh, because they're so incredibly strong. How and many are full-time? I'm full-time, I just resigned my full-time position back in May, so I'm full-time on this now myself. George, my partner, is full-time. Um, Bill and Jim are ramping into, uh, if I can pay them soon, they'll be tempted to quit full-time, uh, as well as Mark Sebeck, so we're all, we're all on board. Can you talk about the size of the market um, and oh, your yes. go-to-market strategy initially? How did you get these first customers and what are you gonna do once you have money? Perfect. Uh, the size of the market, well, there are 12 million Autodesk users, about 400,000 specifically Revit users. Those are the ones who we're going to be plugging into. Um, the architectural visualization market is one of my board of advisors, Jeff Model. He does an annual survey for all 23,000 architecture firms in the world that are licensed. So we know this very specific number of a billion dollars spent as a specific addressable market in visualization. And 70% of that is AR, VR, mobile. So that's the initial, the initial beachhead. The much, much bigger markets that we've been approached by, Ericsson, 3M, uh, LG, about communication, uh, and utility companies, and all across, you know, you wanna walk out and see the pipes that run up the street, you know, without having to unroll a blueprint, that kind of thing. Any, anywhere that you need to see x-ray vision through walls, that's, a, that's another huge market. But initially, we've got a projection of five year annual gross income of 180 million just by the architecture market alone. That's our, our two tier of go to market is the, the monthly software subscription starts with a hundred dollar a month license that again no one said no to yet. I like the holding the frog analogy. It's it's too low for anybody to say no. And then on top of that is our premium package features. So plugins to Revit, uh, feature packages for uh, high end rendering, things like that. Does that make sense? Was, was Dina Ruthie one of your coaches in Mass Challenge? Not formally, but she's been a good mentor after the fact. And uh, are the Autodesk people using your product right now? They, we're actively talking about it, uh, either early investment on their part, which is talking to Dina. Uh, Phil Bernstein was our senior mentor. Um, Rick Rundell's a good friend about I might be moving into their new makerspace when they change locations to, to downtown. Yeah, Dina's great. Analysts, 
talked to lots of the Bella guys. They're great. Yeah. yeah. You did a home run. I feel like I'm a Dancing in the Stars. <laughs> Richard Janicki. I'm the VP of Products and Marketing at Hold it up to your map. Yeah. I'm the VP of Products and Marketing at Hexcube. And Hexcube envisions a world full of autonomous machines, autonomous vehicles, flying in the air, delivering packages to you, watching over cities, cars, taxis, trucks, delivering people and, and goods. And all of these are interacting with people. And somehow we're all supposed to survive that. So this is not a true future. This is a near-term future. You know, Google's driving their cars around. Every car manufacturer has said that they're going to be fielding cars, production, commercial, autonomous vehicles by the year 2020. It happens to be time to the Olympics in Japan, so all the Japanese manufacturers are extremely motivated in particular. So what's the hard part here? It's really not getting these vehicles to drive autonomously. It's how to prove that they're safe. Because the liability is their biggest concern. This is where Execute comes in. How do you prove safety? Well, one way is you drive a million miles and say, well, nothing failed, so I guess it must work. That's actually a legitimate way to prove safety. Uh, Google drives their car around. They collect 10 terabytes of data every day for every eight hour shift. And that adds up to hundreds of petabytes of data that then they need to work with and, and use. What Xcube provides is a distributed simulation and storage cluster for data like that. The precursor to the autonomous vehicles is the advanced driver assist market, ADAS. It's like your lane uh, changing avoidance, it's your collision avoidance, it's these sort of systems. Uh, right now, we have customers that are using it in that market. That market is $15 billion right now, uh, growing to almost $100 billion in five years. The part of that, that's all of the advanced driver assist. The part that's used for uh, developing uh, the tool, developing and testing tools uh, is about $200 million today, growing to almost a billion dollars uh, in five years. So that's the addressable market that we have. <coughs> Xcube is on their second generation of product. It's a combination of hardware and software. The hardware is a distributed cluster uh, that can have hundreds of compute nodes in it, storage, compute network all in every node. And the software is the distributed software cluster for storage and parallel, automatic parallel simulation. So we have this installed right now at big main customers, Honda, Volvo, and uh, the biggest tier one supplier for the Japanese manufacturers, Denso, has this system pictured here uh, as a three petabyte system. We've gotten customer feedback and are already using, they're already using this and, and like it, we're in their second generation. The, um, so the things that it does the best are it sorts through hundreds of petabytes of data looking for just the scenes that developers need they might say, I have to tweak my algorithm for four-way intersections, so I need to have an intersection where there's a pedestrian crossing, there's a car coming from this way, and the sun's in my eye, because that's the one case where my four-way intersection algorithm isn't working. So you find all of those scenes in these hundreds of petabytes of data. Second, you need to simulate that for, to develop your algorithm. So that can take a very long time to do, run those simulations. Uh, we have one customer, Volvo, who's their simulation, generation <coughs> simulation can take a week. Uh, with our system, it runs overnight. We estimate that based upon that, that we can save a year off of development time. So we can bring an autonomous car to the market one year faster instead of six years, it's five years. So this is a high visibility market, high stakes market, 
we're in a unique position to be able to provide a solution. Everybody else is focusing on how do you make the, the car autonomous. We're focusing on how do you make it safe. You've got five seconds left. <laughs> What C-level executive do you sell into and who has the final buy-off on it in the company? And how long is that sales cycle? So, those are very good questions. So we initially go in through the engineering and development, research and development department because they're the ones who can see, who do the simulations early on and they're the ones who can save the week, I didn't say the, you know, the week's worth of simulation in overnight. Um, so we can start small, we can you know, sell systems for $100,000, that's within department level budgets. Uh, to get sign off, we usually have to go to um, either uh, a VP of a platform, cars are built on platforms, so the VP of that platform, or the general manager of, uh, of, of a region, like uh, uh, the one who signed off at Honda, <coughs> is the general manager for Honda Research in Europe. And they love this stuff. They, they're looking for the ways to get the productivity. We address, this is a business level solution sell, so they love it. Are you selling it direct to the uh, headquarters? Or do you sell, for example, through the North American director or the European director, or do you go directly to Honda Japan? Uh, we, we go where the research and development areas are and they're distributed globally. So we, for Honda, we went in through Europe. Um, for Denso, it's straight through Japan, where their headquarters are. For Volvo, it's at their headquarters. <coughs> Any patent protection on this? We have three different patents on this. Uh, one is on the, the distributed virtual file system that allows us to um, have these, all this petabytes of data distributed around and pulling small chunks of that out. You don't want to be pulling you know, these 10 gigabyte files out. We pull out the, the one minute section of scenes that they care about, and uh, that's part of the virtual file system. Uh, the other one is how we, par how we automatically parallelize desktop applications. In this case, a huge simulator that uh, you don't want to have to rewrite with Hadoop or some other parallel language. We have a desktop uh, Windows application. We can run it in parallel automatically on all of, uh, the nodes of our server, collect the results, and return them to the user wherever they are in the world. Is there a way for you to um, tie your system into the developing regulatory process so that these companies are required to produce data or simulations that show safety that are based upon your system? Uh, so probably not based upon our system, but one of the next steps, one of, one of the future steps in our roadmap is to be in, involved in the regulations, become, uh, become a, a test and certification uh, a service that does provide a simulation that meets the regulations. So yes. In a, in a different way, yes. Three short answer questions. Um, how much does it cost? Uh, how much revenue have you had this year so far? And how many of these does General Motors need? Uh, <coughs> very good questions. So the, the systems, we usually get in with a small system, uh, proof of concept system. We make the customers buy the proof of concept. They can evaluate over the web first for free. They, test it in their labs for about $100,000. They buy their first um, development system for a million dollars. And then for a one platform, for every model that comes after that, they need to spend about another half million dollars. So for a platform, um, that's about six to $10 million for all the cars that come off of one platform. Um, each, uh, Car company like General Motors can have around 10 different platforms uh, running at a time. Um, they start every six years, so they do 
you know, 10 platforms a year, but you do, I mean, you do 10 platforms, but they start every six years, but you have 10 model numbers, you know, there's, it's still a lot every year that you need in $6 million for every platform start you get. Um, the sales cycle on this takes us about six months to get that proof of concept system in, six months to get to production, uh, you know, production, and then six months to get a follow on and it can be a little longer depending on whether it's just a single project like we have at Volvo. And Volvo is a little, it's about that. The Honda, we're actually going to be standardized as the uh, research and development platform for simulation across the company. So that takes an additional six months to get that done. A little bit about, if I remember correctly, about a million sales this year. Yeah. Um, so how many customers is that? Um, and have, have they already committed to this million dollar initial platform level? Um, and what are your funds being used for? Right, so thank you for reminding me on the revenues, right? So we had a million, uh, we're gonna be about a million and a half, we were about a million last year. Uh, so we're, we're funding ourselves bootstrapping through customer uh, revenue right now. Uh, there, um, we have, we actually started in the uh, defense area with unmanned aero vehicles uh, and brought that to the technology down to autonomous vehicles. So we have some legacy customers in the aerospace. One of our biggest is Boeing. So um, uh, about half of our revenue from this past year came from Boeing. Uh, the other parts come from uh, Honda, uh, Volvo, and one of our technology partners is Tass International. They make simulators, so we're partnering with them. They, they're buying our equipment to push it to their, so they can sell it to their customers. So we have sales channels in place as well. Did I miss a question? So the existing for your future market, how many? Oh pilots are in okay. place because it's just right. like the first platform is a million dollars. I assume you know, people who are piloting it right now paying for it. Right. So we have Denso has bought one of the million dollar size. Boeing has a million dollar size uh, platform. Uh, Honda and Volvo both have uh, you know hundred thousand dollar platforms and there so Honda we expect to go into production as a standard uh, by the summer. It's coming summer. Volvo will, should go into production around the same time. We don't have as good a feel for that, but they love it. And uh, we don't know the time frame for moving forward, though. Uh, and we've actually actively engaged with Delphi, uh, you know, the number one tier one supplier for North America and pretty good in Europe. Uh, they're about to buy their, their proof of concept system. Website. 
with a customer type portal structure. Icon Connect has patented voice over IP from the website to the customer without the right direct contact. Meaning, if I click my, an icon, I make a direct call versus having to log in, create a profile or structure. Through four lines of code, HTML, we can voice enable any website across the globe. Last year alone, LL Bean spent over $300,000 trying to implement click to call. Cost to implement our solution, an hour and a half. <coughs> we are a SaaS based solution, which we, call, we charge on a monthly basis for both a service fee and a permanent charge. Currently 800 number, permanent charge is 3.9 cents. Through VOIP, we come in between 1.5 and, and excuse me, sorry, 2.5 to 1.9 cents per minute. Overall, our competition is 800 numbers, such as AT&T, Verizon, possibly in the future, voice over IP, such as Vonage, Skype. We have patented this both by a process patent and also a um, procedural patent. <coughs> Organizationally, corporately, our CEO is Jeff Strunk. Previously, Jeff Strunk in 1999 was CEO of the year for the state of Maine for Strunk Games. Tracy Butler, COO, currently in the operational organization, major design and marketing organization overall. CFO, uh, William Spears, CFO for Strunk Games. Uh, <coughs> COO, operating officer for Timberland and several other organizations overall. Myself, CTO, I've been director of IT for eight major corporations across the US, last in the auto industry previously to this, with having implemented voice over IP for both the US military prior and also through corporations. On our advisory board, we have, um, sorry, Kershir Skipchak. Skipchak was prior board member of WebEx. Um, also, we have uh, prior VP of Verizon, Arnie Eckelman, and also um, current CEO and primary board member of Olympia um, Management, uh, Kevin Mahaney. Organizationally, We've been in beta mode for the last month and a half with Auto Europe, we, um, the RAC, and a couple of the smaller clients. Auto Europe has agreed to implement into European production in the next week and a half. LOV, we're currently phased to go live with in February. Due to their Christmas rush, they couldn't afford to resolve the people to finalize that hour and a half. Overall, organizationally, we've had numerous successes and deliveries. Thank you very much. Hold on, I have a question on your revenue projection. Mm -hmm and it ties into the beta. You're showing revenue of $10 million next year. That's correct. Um, and you're in beta now. Mm -hmm. Is the product absolutely bulletproof if you roll that thing out right now to um, ramp up to 10 million sales? Auto year, we have been testing globally. Uh, they've been using it internally, primarily, on, an own, on their own internal web prop portal. They've actually been using it for meetings and other things also. <coughs> and they've had a call stream up to 125 calls concurrently. So um, currently we're across um, all platforms of browser-based structure and also have a um, iOS app on the market space. Is it beta right now? Hmm? So this really isn't beta, this is a full? 
no, we we haven't actually been. We're, we just cut over beta in November. They've been doing beta testing. They haven't begun paying for it as a service as a. We'll classify it as non-beta once they start putting it in the first check. So your, sorry, your sales proposition is that this, at, at best, will save 50% of the cost for a company. Um, right. Is that correct? That's um, correct. And in the past, anything VoIP has had difficulty with delays, quality, et cetera. Has that been resolved? Because for that, savings it doesn't seem to be um, worth taking the risk that the voice quality is not there. Um, Auto Europe has been using it throughout Japan back to the US, from <coughs> Germany back to the US and have both customers and users uh, reporting quality acceptability. Um, Auto Europe as an organization implemented text as a process. Their text to voice turnaround time uh, it takes four times as long to process a uh, request via text than it does via voice. Just an overall scope. So let's say uh, L.O. Bean becomes a paying customer. What does that mean in terms of revenue? How much does L.O. Bean pay your company in a year? L.O. Bean to our organization in a year on a cost basis is a price per dialer perspective. We currently are currently priced at $9.99 a dialer. They're looking at uh, 1,000 dialers per month. And a per minute charge of 1.9 cents a minute if they choose to use our SIP servers versus implementing their own. So do the math for us, please. <laughs> <laughs> do the math for you. Overall, it's the total number is Roughly around eleven thousand dollars flat rate per month, and on the ch per minute charge, their current per per minute call rate on their eight hundred numbers is three and a half cents per minute, and they're spending over two point five million dollars a year on per minute charges alone. We are looking to charge them half that rate. Okay, so given what you just said, um, wouldn't it be logical that if this is as easy to use as you're projecting it to be? that more people will be calling in, and they'll actually have higher telecommunications costs. Have you figured out how that translates to more business for them? From an overall perspective, L.O. Bean currently today on a click-to-call basis, out of 12 requests, gets one customer to respond. That's 11%, 11 lost customers per transaction. This should at least increase that sales rate over 50%. seems to me um, closer to a feature than a company. <clears throat> Basically for the same reason. companies like Cabletron, Cisco, Nortel, back when those names meant something. Uh, I have recently been involved in product development for a Fortune 1000 company in the Internet of Things uh, and just launched this company along with another startup back in 2006 that was a teleco infrastructure company. My co-founder, Allison, is a 20-year uh, mental health professional. She's a licensed uh, social worker and clinical psychologist. She works for McLean. <coughs> and one day she happened to mention that uh, she would love to have a light therapy device in her office while she works. She prescribes it for her patients often. And she uh, said, well, that should be easy to do. But they're very disruptive. So none of the products that are out there, and you're probably familiar, it's not a new technology. Been around for 30 years, 
great experiences with people that use light therapy in seasonal affective disorder situations, but nothing that is uh, workable in an office setting. <coughs> I said, boy, I can do something like that, and put together a team of about 15 individuals that I've known throughout my career from companies that I named earlier, and the life light was born. We built three of these prototypes, uh, sent them out to some development partners, including TJX, Digital uh, Credit Union, and BAE. They provided us with feedback, and we spun the design, or pivoted a little bit, and we are building 500 units that will be delivered uh, just before Christmas this year. We have several more evaluation clients that are teed up, including Constant Contact, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield in Massachusetts, and many other companies who recognize the health and wellness benefits of taking care of their employees, plus the recruiting benefits to do so. We raised $150,000 to, to get this rolling. It's kind of a shoestring, uh, but all of these particular contacts that I mentioned helped us with the design, did so without a uh, you know capital spend on our part. So it's been a great experience. Our manufacturer is building without, without a cash outlay for us. He's a user of light therapy products being built in Atlanta. And the market is vast and wide as you can imagine. 400 million workstation users globally, uh, and that's growing. So companies are investing heavily in health and wellness for their employee base. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts installed a stand-up, sit-down workstation desk for every one of their employees, over a thousand employees. That's not a small spend. Our product is $150, average retail price. It operates with an app that's an Internet of Things connection. So we'll take information like weather. Uh, if you wear a Fitbit device that tracks your sleep, we will read that into our app, uh, combine your schedule, uh, if you want us to read in Patriot's schedule, for instance, they play Sunday night, you wake up Monday morning, it's a rainy day, and you got to bed at 12.30, they lost, and you had a restless sleep, so four hours of sleep. <laughs> we would recommend a higher level of intensity over a longer duration for Monday so that you can operate at your peak. And we'll learn over time as you provide us with feedback after the fe at the end of the day provide us with feedback and we will learn your particular needs of sunlight each and every day. I get asked often, you know, we have a bunch of windows in our office, companies are investing lots in windows and I often joke with the facilities director, they say, do you call work off on rainy days? Well, if it's raining outside, windows don't do you any good. As a matter of fact, windows don't do you any good letting the sun in because the particular uh, wavelength of light, 480 nanometers, that sky blue, that's the only effective light for this particular phys physiology to train your circadian rhythm. Without that, it doesn't do much good, except psychologically. Physiology, we've affected. Psychologically, it's nice to have windows. Okay, you've got five seconds. That's it. Okay. <laughs> Work as well or better than the traditional light box? Right, so the, the we deliver. That's a yes or no, that's a yes or no question. Yes. yes. Um, and are you going the consumer route or are you going the insurance reimbursement route? We're going direct to the end customers, enterprises. In manufacturing these first units, were these hand built almost? And as you ramp up, see what your major issue is going to be manufacturing a lot of these units. Is the manufacturer invested in the startup line? Is that something you'll have to invest in the tooling? And what will that cost? Yeah, so the tooling is about $30,000 for the mold. It's cast aluminum. So this is 3D printed plastic. Our look will be a la these guys. Uh, and the manufacturer will will fund the tooling for repayment over a, an amortized piece part price. So th this is a uh, electronics manufacturer, uh, similar to a Selectron back in the day. Yeah. So why will they set up the production line? 
Where? Or what? No. What time frame for the production line, and what do you see as the production levels going to? Hundreds of thousands. Yeah. So we expect to uh, deliver 60,000 units by June 2016. That's based on our evaluation clients. You know, assuming that the product works as we say it does, which it will, uh, we expect 60,000 units by June. This will be done in Atlanta, but they also have Mexico and Chinese facilities as well. Can you explain? Um, so there are many products <coughs> like this out there, um, and this is clearly something that's needed by a very particular population. My understanding is you're trying to take this from a particular population to the entire population and saying that this is beneficial. Um, one of the things that I'm thinking is you have one of these on your desk and automatically everyone knows that you either stayed up too late at the Patriots game or um, you have an issue. Um, and some, so I, there's some stigma around this and you're taking something that's needed by a very small population and saying everyone needs this. Do you have something documented or something that you can point to that talks about why you think that is actually true? Sure. So actually, state-of-the-art science has shown that everybody is impacted by being sunlight deprived, not just those that have seasonal affective disorder. That's an extreme example of sunlight deprivation, but those of us that work indoors because we're built to be outdoors in the sun, that 480 nanometers that affect our circadian rhythm entrainment is impactful on everyone. So by delivering, you know, this is the market share leader, Philips. This product and everybody else's sits on a desktop, shines up into your eyes. Very glare producing. You don't want to look at that every day while you're working. So what we did was, because of the state of the art science and today's technology, we made it more universally appealing. So the lamp looks like a desk lamp it would not be one-off. So these enterprises are going to deploy it as they do for a stand-up, sit-down workstation. People could say similar things, oh, you must have a back issue. But they do it for everybody because they recognize, without real clear data, that it's good. It must be good. You should stand up. It must be good for you. This actually has scientific research that supports it. It's good for everybody. Cognitive functioning is improved, focus, alertness, etc. So productivity will be boosted by any enterprise that deploys this. So, um, <clears throat> I'd like to explore with you a little bit on David's first question, the insurance reimbursement. Um, going from selling individually to customers to selling uh, with insurance reimbursement or with the promise of the insurance bill going down for a company might take this from a nice to have to a need to have. Do you have any plans for doing that? Right, so in insurance companies as client advocates is why we're targeting those major carriers initially. So Blue Cross Blue Shield has a large number of computer using office professionals as their employee base. They accept the use of this and then they advocate for its use within their insurance. Yes, <coughs> offering premium reductions as they do with Fitbit things of, those na of that nature. So that's, that's a pretty trendy thing to do and growing in popularity. So yes, we expect uh, insurance carriers to offer premium reductions because this is a beneficial system that they already cover for individuals that are diagnosed with seasonal affective disorder, for instance. To do it for universal appeal because it does improve everyone's health is something that, that we expect to have happen and yes, that will be a, a major channel for us. Well, why don't you address Gail's issue or question by putting a simple desk lamp illumination on the bottom so that you're providing both illumination for the desk and therapy for uh, the user? Yeah, so we're not a product company. We are a system solution company. So that is one of the follow-on products that we will be doing along with a uh, LED uh, UV development effort that's ongoing at Boston University where we'll also deliver ultraviolet light onto the hands at your keyboard for instance so it's a good suggestion and yes task lighting is part of the future product evolution okay. Gary, you want to I do. Can you just, so Philips obviously has what's used out there it's it glares whatever 
other than the design and it not glaring, what's different about your product so that Philips tomorrow doesn't say that's a better design um, and I'll change how mine looks? Yeah, so Philips acquired these guys back in 2006. Uh, they're not in the business of creating products like this. This solution goes direct to consumer for seasonal affective disorder sufferers. It was purpose built to sit on the desktop and to dedicate time. Our product is directionally uh, flexible, infinitely so. It's the sky, the sun comes down into your eyes from above, doesn't produce the glare. They are not capable through our patent protection from creating a light product and we cast a very broad net in our 20 claims around a workstation environment to incorporate 480 nanometer light that protects our ability to do this. Not only the desk lamp version, clip on to your monitor, hang from your petition walls, etc. The other aspects that we have protected are the algorithm to calculate the amount of sunlight you should get for each individual user. That's important. People don't want to necessarily mess around with how much they need on any given day. Our app will provide that kind of uh, coaching for the user and recommendation. because it's an area I don't have much expertise in. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. My name is David Saad. I'm the founder of Leakies. The amateur sports leagues are run by people that donate their time, and very often that time takes all year. They have to be concerned with signing up players, coaches, obtaining fields, sponsors, getting uniforms, creating a schedule, getting quarry checks for all adults that are involved in the league, and communicating all the news to parents. Leagueies, unlike any of its competition, is designed to run all team sports, baseball, soccer, softball, basketball, football, lacrosse, and hockey. Leagueies addresses every aspect of administering the league, providing leagues with a website, online registration, a schedule, a team pages, player pages, statistics, a communication system, a news page, fundraising ability, create as many divisions as the league needs, displays league and team photos and logos, a mobile app that can be run right from a person's cell phone rather than be tied to a computer. They, say, they can safely share their player and team accomplishments um, with their aunt in Idaho, and they can also link up with their Facebook. It also provides turn-by-turn -turn field directions during a tournament or for any type of game, turn-by-turn -turn directions right from their cell phone. If for any reason a game has changed, typically people show up, they find out the game has been changed for some reason, and they're upset. Well, as soon as a game has changed and a commissioner has decided to change it for any reason, automatically and immediately a text message and an email is sent right to the cell phone, as well as their email com computers, therefore alluding to people that the game has been changed, and that's for parents, coaches, and players. The League East team is made up of myself, founder. I played baseball my entire life. I've spent more than 30 years running the league. A lot of frustration, and that's why I've been assigned League East. I'm also one of only two New England players to have been inducted into the National Amateur Baseball Hall of Fame. I've also started and sold a number of other companies. One of my partners, Noah Clark, played and coached baseball for more than 40 years. He also founded Town Dock, an $80 million dollar fish processing company located in Narragansett in Rhode Island. Between Noah and myself, we have won more than 38 regional, national, and international baseball titles. Martin Bloomberg is also a part of the team. He's an entrepreneur and has produced and developed for more than 40 years different companies. 
He's been president of a subsidiary of Wolverine Worldwide Trade, a technical recruiter and web business. He's also an expert in managing pay-per-click ad campaigns in a B2B environment. The market is $35 billion are spent each year on sports-related products. $8 billion are spent by people 16 and older on equipment and sports apparel. $300 million are spent on fees alone by parents and adults playing in such leagues. The sport uh, competition. Sports administrative platforms have a fairly new products and technology and have been around for about four years. There are several competing platforms such as League Apps, Teams, Game Changer, and League Lineup. All provide a website and online registration, and that's it. Game Changer, one of our competitors, has approached us with the possibility of adding their app to ours as a plugin. Aptopia, uh, an app reseller and designer, and the Men's Senior Baseball League has made inquiries to purchase League Ease at this moment, which we're really not interested in. It is our intent to grow League Ease to the point where it can go public, or a position, or position it to be sold for a fair market value as, or as much money as possible at a later date. The U.S. market numbers are quite impressive. However, outside of the U.S., a platform like this does not exist. And when you go outside of the United States, where a lot of these sports are being played, it is, the numbers become incredible. The Men's Senior Baseball League, a national adult amateur baseball organization, intends on replacing their current platform with League East right after the first of the year when their current uh, contract expires. We will also be meeting with the American Legion B Baseball National the first week in January and are working out the details to meet with Little League National International. This Friday we'll, we will be meeting with a Massachusetts senator whose staff played and used League East and, were, and would like us to provide League East to inner cities, distressed areas to help keep kids playing sports and off the streets. He'd like us to provide it free or through a grant. It is our intent to give to give a basic version of League Ease for free to the world. Squad Locker, a national sports uniform company, and Anthem Sports, an equipment company, have indicated its a desire to sell their products online. Okay. <laughs> Once you have the freemium model, what's what's the next level up? What are the price points? Um, you talked a little bit about some of the leagues, so I like that 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 idea. How do you segment the market uh, between you know your Saturday morning uh, town league versus the American Legion, and what's your distribution strategy? We found that whether they're a Saturday morning league or a Sunday morning league or the regular little league or adult league, it's pretty uh, pretty um, serious. They all want to, they all liked and used this platform and would like to use it and continue using it. Our price points would be uh, on a yearly basis, on a subscription basis, uh, which would be anywhere from $5 a play. Or we would charge on a team basis. We're testing, we're, we're, we've been testing that out right now. What's your channel slash distribution strategy? Which is, we're meeting and reaching out to league presidents. Or, um, national organizations such as Men's Senior Baseball League, Little League International, American Legion, because we would like them to be able to give it to their organization as the uh, uh, as the uh, platform of record. Any other questions? So, uh, Duke, you know, did a little bit of homework, I mean, and I Googled um, sports league, amateur sports league uh, software. And when I got up to 50, I stopped counting. Um, so how are you planning to rise above the noise? Well, most of, I would say, I'm, I'm going to say all of this deal with two things. With providing a league with a website, you know, with standings, and, I'm sorry, and online registration. And that's it. That's where it stops. Ours takes it a little bit further. We, we, we provide statistics. We provide a communication system that none of them have which we found that most leagues find to be the most valuable component because it is very frustrating, especially during tournaments and when people show up and find out that a league and their game has been delayed. We've also found that through theirs, they are holding on to all of the advertising money. We hold on to some of it, but we're also providing all of our league with real estate on the team and player pages 
so that they can use it for fundraising for local businesses. And all also too, our team and our team at Player Pages are automatically created as the commissioner creates them. I'm struggling with, uh, a little bit with the business model. Um, I've had kids who have been on teams that have communication tools, and I can't remember, unfortunately, the name of the one that they use, but it does most of what you're saying and is very effective, but I am concerned about how many people are out there doing this. The, your business model, though, I'm trying to figure out, do you ultimately make more money because of the advertising space? And so if that's so, eyeballs is most important. Um, and so, but you're charging for those eyeballs. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out where you're really making the money um, and how quickly you're going to be able to get those eyeballs. And clearly, your expertise is in the baseball area, which is where you're having traction. Um, but how you move from that? Well, we found that it, although we were charging, you know, we tested charging, we found that to give one of the <clears throat> basic version, which includes 99% of the entire app. Giving that away free and getting as many high balls as possible and making our money with the advertising portion. And the, the, we found that the fastest way to do that is to reach out to the national organizations, and that's where we've been fairly successful up to this point. What's your revenue forecast for 2016 and 2017? Uh, it's really yet to be determined. We're, we're, we're new. And I'm hoping to be able to get this in front of as many eyes as possible to be able to bring on some retailers and possibly get this up to somewhere between a quarter of a million to a half a million dollars or revenue. Okay, folks. Oh, Steve, are you in or out? Uh, I, I, area, again, I had very little expertise in. revolutionizing app discovery by turning app search into a game. Uh, we all know the pain of searching through millions of apps on app stores. That's all right. We all know the pain of searching through millions of apps on app stores looking for the right app. It's a frustrating experience and at the end usually are presented with sponsored and featured apps. The vast majority of great apps are never discovered on app stores, despite the fact that developers are spending millions of dollars in app discovery each and every day. We've solved that problem by converting text-based search into a visually rich, compelling game experience, where independent third-party apps are played as a part of our game experience. Our games are topic-based, linked and related journeys through third-party apps that are tied to the content somebody is seeking. We're a true game experience. We offer rewards and we can unlock levels by people downloading and playing apps that are related to our game. We carefully screen and select third-party apps using a combination of technical and manual curation and then an additional manual review by category experts to ensure that the best third-party apps are included in our game experience. Our technology is adaptive. The more a player uses our game, the more the system learns what they like and how they play. The system then recommends additional apps they may be interested in discovering. Our game is free to use, so how do we make money? We make money by charging sponsored app developers a cost per install fee every time their third-party app is downloaded and played within the context of our game. Last week, we released the first 
application of our technology. It's an app game called STEM Quest. And in that time, we have added 250 users that have downloaded a total of 750 third-party apps. That means we're converting each user into three third-party game installs. That means we can offer developers a three-to-one advantage over traditional user acquisition strategies, which are usually intrusive banner ads. And we can do it at half the cost. So we're three times more effective and we're half as expensive. Our technology requires no SDKs or code modification to the independent third-party apps, so we're a very low friction option for these developers or for these, for these apps to incorporate into our game. Uh, app discovery is an emerging app discovery that has embedded, as a part of embedded content. So in other words, third-party apps that are embedded in gameplay for discovery purposes is an emerging market. It's, it's fairly new. Um, the winners in the space are going to be providing these end-to-end -end solutions, like we do, from developer all the way through to consumer. Uh, there are competitors. Uh, there's a few competitors in the space, early competitors. Um, include a company called Vitro in San Francisco. They're a startup. They display app discovery as a part of a graphical cluster interface, where you see little indications, graphical indications of apps that follow the searches that you're looking for. That's very different than ours, which is an immersive game experience. It's a part of the game experience as opposed to a simple graphical interface. Um, other companies, uh, Appalicious, uh, XYO, Digital Turbine, these companies offer alternative app discovery methodologies and app search methodologies. Um, at, um, Exit, recent M&A activity, we consider ourselves a next generation ad tech company. And companies in the ad tech space over the last year, um, our last two years, there's been 120 transactions totaling $5 billion in deal value. Um, in the last six months, there's been 30 plus transactions in the 50 to $150 million range. Founding team is myself, CEO, uh, Wei Chang, who's here today, uh, and a key founding advisor, Dwayne Compton. And together, we represent early in in 12 startups, uh, five acquisitions, and two IPOs. Uh, up to this point, we've been funded by friends and family and our own investment, and we're going to use funds for scale at this point. That's it. That's it. You have to I'm going to pass the chair. First question, um, how is your um, discovery app going to be discovered? By the users. Initially, we're using the very same methodologies that we're competing against. So we're going out on a cost per install or cost per impression ad campaign. So currently, we're paying the two dollar and fifty to three dollar per cost per install basis to acquire a user, and then we're leveraging that into three today, and we think it's going to grow to six to nine as we add additional features in our game experience. And this is only the first game we're launching. It can we can have a game for virtually any uh, app category, simulation, or game. You said that there's no SDK needed for these app developers. Uh, do they have to register with you? No, they don't. We're right now limited to Google, Android apps, and Google Play. If we go to Apple and we're planning to, that will require an SDK and some code modification of their app. But in the Google environment, we can onboard these apps without, without their knowledge or agreement. We select them, and based on our selection criteria, we will then reach out to them for uh, being a participating app. For how many of these you're going to, to have access to? Uh, in terms of apps? Yes. The universe of apps that people have access well, to? Well, on Google using. Play right now, there are about 1.6 million apps, and in, um, in Apple, another 1.6, 1.7. So about 3 million apps today. Are you limiting yourself about being able to go to uh, Apple right now? And how are you going to get these people to sign up if there's one? There's so many of them. How are you going to get these people to sign on to your system from Apple? Well, uh, as I mentioned, Apple will require an SDK modification to the code of those independent apps. Um, if we, once we do that, and we're doing it now, then we will submit it to Apple. In terms of acquiring customers that are using iOS devices or Android devices, again, initially we're using our competitors' networks, our cost per install, cost per impression advertising networks. Per click or per install? 
Right now, a year ago, it was $1.50. Right now, it's almost $3. It's doubled in the last uh, year. Um, and the system is broken in many ways because people are paying cost per install fees for these uh, intrusive and interstitial banner ads that don't have the results in terms of developer downloads. The so developers aren't making money. They're, they're trying. They need a better methodology. And the industry is recognizing that app discovery is a part of better play is the future of app discovery and search. I think I heard you say that um, you guys are determining uh, what the good apps by categories, and then you're approaching those app developers and saying, hey, would you like us to feature you in, uh, in our platform, in our, in our game? Is that right, basically? Initially, we're going to we search for the best apps, because it's all about the gameplay within the experience. We then uh, are reaching out to the developers that have created those apps to to be a participating sponsored installer. Today, our game doesn't highlight, there's no difference between sponsored and non-sponsored apps. Over time, we expect that there will be a placement difference and an engagement difference based on sponsor level. And we'll make that clear to our users as well. And, and how many um, apps per category do you think is the right number for me to discern amongst? Yeah, we've done a fair amount of research on that. And we believe that 100 apps as a collection within a topic search category is about the number. Uh, two or three hundred, you begin to think about uh, being an app store or a certain type of consolidator. You know, but we, we believe a hundred people can go through a hundred, uh, interact and engage with a hundred over time, depending on the category, and then download. As, as I mentioned now, they're downloading three or four. We hope that'll be uh, more like 10 or 15 as we add additional features, rewards, and unlocking levels based on your download and engagement with that app. Help me understand this. This is predominantly for game players because you're making this a game. So if I'm searching for something that's not a game, I don't really want to go through games. So can you talk about who you're really targeting and what the areas are of the apps that they're searching for, how they're doing it today? Because uh, I understand for game players this might be interesting, but for so many of the apps that are out there, people don't want to play games. Sure. If the vast majority of apps available on app stores are game related. So the big chunk of apps that are out there are game related. Um, this lends itself very easily to a gameplay environment because it is a game as a part of the environment. Our STEM Quest app is a game related to science, technology, engineering, and math. And all of the topics in there are related to STEM in some category. But they're designed for, you know, this particular application is designed for 10-year-olders up to 15-year-olders that are looking to reinforce or learn topics on STEM. That said, we have mapped out a way to use a level of engagement. It wouldn't be called a game, but for example, um, some people download funny apps all the time, changing face apps or dub smash where you lip sync against songs. We've come up with ways to replicate experiences that are similar to the apps that we're exposing. So our funny world of apps will be a funny, fun experience. So each time you discover, if, and, and, and I've got friends that are probably really juvenile, and they're, they're always sending me links to these, the next funny app. Um, so we're going to come up with an experience that replicates that experience. It's actually fun to be in to discover the next app. So it lends itself to game, first and foremost, primarily. Education as well as non-education game, but secondarily to other app simulations and, uh, and experiences. Great. There goes my fourth chair turn. Norm is out. Gail is out. Okay, David. We really, really like you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks, everybody. I'm Martin Bloomberg, and I've been an entrepreneur and product developer for over 40 years. My web company, Thermobind, is seven years old and a distributor for the three largest global manufacturers of a niche office product called Thermobinding. We import our own lines as well. Volume is over $750,000 and we're profitable. Sales are generated through pay-per-click advertising, SEO, and referrals from happy customers. We see three problems in the area of desktop presentation solutions. First, over 90% of the half billion dollar business is using 30 to 60 year old technology that's tedious, difficult, and relatively ugly. Twin loop, comb, velo, and spiral buying all require punching a lot of holes. Then you have to hope everything lines up. Then you need to weave in the spine. 
and it's hard if you have to replace a page to start all over again. We have an easier, faster system with a better look. What we sell are empty books. They have hot melt adhesive inside, and all you have to do is drop in your contents, put the book in a thermal binding machine, which is like a toaster. You put a dozen in at a time, and you can have a dozen 25 page reports done in a minute. Um, thermal binding started in Europe, where it has a 30% market share, compared to 5% in the US. Uh, it started about 10 years later here in the US. If we, if we just catch up to Europe, the US market will jump from 20 million to 120 million in sales. And I want to talk about the soft covers here now. We'll add to our organic growth, we'll target the email campaign, link to industry specific landing pages, we'll contact large potential, potential users, we'll customize sample packages. I've got two new employees, each with over 25 years experience in related areas coming in in the next two weeks. We're targeting realtors, financial services companies, insurance companies, EDUs, and government agencies. Existing customers, Merrill Lynch, Lockheed, Volvo, Remax, Keller Williams, BDO, Morgan Stanley, the FBI, the Diamond Chocolates, and the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, an example, uh, you've probably seen our brochure on TV, it's for Boy. The sweet spot is when a company wants to have a consistent look across the country, but then they want to enable their agents to make a customized presentation right on the desktop for a particular client. And we did 100,000 pieces of this for them. Um, all this business has been done in just three people. Uh, the second problem is how to broaden the market so anyone can make a professional custom presentation without expensive equipment. We have the US patent. We're just about to get the European patent. It's imminent. And we are patent pending worldwide on a new form of binding. It's new and it's not new. It's an improvement over the old slide binder. When you were a kid, you probably got a default piece of, of uh, plastic, you throw in a few pages, you slip this, this triangular profile over it, and the problem is the pages fell out. We came up with the idea of the first stapling product. We created a triangular profile with teeth on the inside that form tracks so that you can never lose a page. You can use your own front and back page, you can customize it, and for pennies, you can create a professional looking presentation that is nice, as nice as anything on the market. It's going to be sold worldwide. The market's already there. Slide writers are sold in almost every major uh, drugstore, uh, Walmart, uh, uh, college bookstores, uh, almost every place you go. We have a better mousetrap here. Um, We think that uh, staple manufacturers would see an opportunity to sell more and higher capacity staplers, along with our slide binders, and this is consumable. We also think we have global licensing opportunities. A third problem that we're addressing is that of hardcover presentations. Right now, ring binders are the most common way of putting together small quantities of durable presentations. They're bulky, not very attractive or secure. It's not the kind of presentation you want if you're trying to land a big deal. We have hardcover that we're already doing, this one's for Keller Williams, um, and we're finding that this is a much more attractive type of presentation. Um, we are also uh, find that in the photo book area, it's a $300 million market for your Shutterfly alone, um, and we have now partnered with an 80-year-old company uh, to put our profile inside uh, photo books so that people can make their photo books at home at a much lower price than they get any place, bypassing Shutterfly, bypassing the uh, drugs are changed and that are all jumping into this app. And what they see is what they're going to get. Right now, there's a big problem because people will send out their photos by email and what comes back, already now, may not be what they like. Um, most of my three suppliers... Thank you very much. Um, um, use of funds. Like we, obviously, we can't talk about how much you need, but what is it that you're um, trying to do well, or to grow? Okay. Um, well, I do have two new employees coming up. I'm trying to ramp up. And basically, my business is growing almost passively. It's just pretty much Google AdWords, and uh, 
and the orders have been coming in so fast that I don't have time to do anything else. So I need to replace myself to pursue some of these other things to some degree. Um, and we need to be more proactive and kind in terms of reaching out directly to um, major corporations and to the verticals that we've discovered we know are likely buyers of this product. Uh, with regard to, we're setting up production in the U.S. for the hardcovers, which is a huge market, particularly in the photo book area. We're going to need to spend some money um, you know, just to, to create inventory. Um, we need outreach you know, to, to promote this. And we need to find somebody uh, who has global licensing experience. We need some high level expertise uh, to get where we want to go. I have a question. Yes. If they give you money, how are they going to make money? Okay. All three of my major suppliers have, at one time or another, expressed an interest in, in trying to buy me. One of them was trying to force me to sell. Um, we think that um, we can partner with a stable manufacturer, sell to our existing suppliers, sell to our competitors. Um, we can grow the business, maybe go through successive, round, successive rounds of financing. There's enough here that if it works, we can take it to IPO. Otherwise, I'm 68 <coughs> years old. I want to get up in a couple of years. I want to build it up to whatever I can get it to be, and then I, I'm not worried about finding a buyer. I have plenty of people right. In fact, as we get into this more, my current suppliers, one of them will probably become a customer, and the other one's going to fight for me not to let that happen and try to buy me instead. So I, I'm in an interesting position. What do you estimate the multiple on revenue upon exit to be? I haven't figured it based on revenue, but I figured it on, based upon gross profit. Uh, well, not gross profit. I was offered two and a half times what my purchases were from, from one of the companies. What what are, what are purchases? You know, it's, what, when I uh, I bought product from them and say I bought one hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of product, they were willing to to um, to give me uh, almost four hundred thousand dollars paid out over three years for that part of my business. That was a third of it. One more point on this. Because we're an internet business, because there are other, I have competitors in the same business, many of them could just take my accounts, redirect everything off this website, or, and, and, and it's all going to drop to their bottom line. They already have shipping departments that are already carry similar products. So it, it, it's an attractive and mobile type of situation for, for some. Any other questions? David. Uh, with regard to the don't see how I can make a multiple on my investment. I, I don't, I'm not sure if I could talk myself to think I can make 10 times my investment uh, off of the company. And, and I, and I uh, uh, wrong answer. I think we live in a digital world. I don't really see how this is going to work. I'm out. Um, just an area I'm not comfortable with. Uh, I spent six years at Xerox and was actively involved in printing and binding for a while, so I would be interested in talking. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Sammy Jatan. I'm COO and co-founder of Pivot the World. Our CTO, Magnus Samarsen, is sitting in the back. And I'm Esma Jabber, I'm CEO and co-founder. And I want you for a second to imagine if you could see what this very building used to look like in the past. That's what Pivot the World is doing. And this all started actually after I tragically lost my father while in graduate school. And I wanted a way to remember his homeland of Palestine and the history that he used to share with us growing up in rural South Carolina. So I wanted to experience that and still be connected to that history. And that's what initially brought me to this. So when Harvard University came to us, actually won grand prize in an innovation startup, uh, competition. Uh, they wanted a mobile app that they could use to engage their tourists and they could update them in real time with historic photos and information and events. And after a successful Kickstarter campaign and media attraction, we soon realized that we were offering a product that, not just, that did not just meet Harvard's needs. Uh, it solved three main problems. Number one, universities were seeing a decline in alumni and outside visitor engagement. 
on average, less than 5% of alumni donate to their alma mater, and less than 10% of Harvard's tourists go through the official Harvard tour. That was a big problem. Uh, number two, tourism company, uh, particularly those caring to heritage tourists, are using outdated and clunky modes of technology. Think those uh, old audio tours and uh, pamphlets that cost a lot of money to reproduce and hand out for free on a monthly basis. And number three, museums were seeing a decline in repeat <coughs> visitors. Uh, most museums in the United States are lucky if they get 30% repeat visitors. So our solution, it's mobile. It's the best way to get historical content to users who are looking to accomplish a feedback loop and to get them more engaged, especially in alumni communities. We expect higher engagement when we deploy our user-generated content uh, mechanism, which we like to call shoebox archiving, and it's what, what won us grand prize. Um, it's a solution that will allow for institutional content and personalized content, what we call the shoebox archives, to be utilized in the Pivot network. And that's what we're building, the Pivot network that is a free-to-download app that allows tourists to see what a specific place through time uh, looked like. Uh, and the app works for both users on-site and off-site. For users who are on-site, they use our augmented reality technology uh, to look at a landmark and see exactly what it looked like in the past. That's where we're incubated at the Harvard Innovation Lab. Uh, simply pivot your, your phone, do that motion, and you go back in time. For off-site users, think Google Street View, but through a lens of time. You virtually visit a place, and you go back in time with the pivot button, and you see what that thing looked like in the past, and get historical multimedia. multimedia. So it's networked. Uh, the content management system is how we get that data. Uh, we get it from reputable institutions, and they upload the content, the photos, the themes, the, uh, the tours, and uh, they send the users notifications of uh, seasonal events occur, and they engage their clients and get that feedback loop. In addition to sourcing from institutions, we're going to also crowdsource from social networks. Again, that's the shoebox idea, but that's what funding will be used for. Uh, we're currently one third of, of our way of meeting our fundraising goal. So we see ourselves as part of the ed tech industry, catering to a total addressable market of the $2 billion of uh, marketing budgets of U.S. museums and universities, and to the $4.1 billion of tours and activities market, and that's just within the U.S. tourism industry alone. Our first customer is Harvard University, who will be using our app actually this month for their official Harvard tours, and we're currently targeting other Boston area institutions um, before expanding nationwide as well. And uh, we have uh, two more clients also in, in the loop. Um, our main revenue stream is B2B right now. Uh, we charge institutions a subscription monthly fee for three kind of basic packages. There's a, there's a basic, there's a premium, and then there's the development of a custom and maintenance of a custom app as well. This is what Harvard has. Our first 12 clients will actually generate us $150,000 of revenue for subscription plans, and our financial projections have us at breaking even after year two or with about 50 B2B clients. Um, we also, uh, so just a little bit of our team, since we don't have that slide up, but um, Sammy studied history and journalism. Uh, Magnus, our CTO, is a computer engineer with over two decades of uh, experience in R&D and in launching mobile apps, uh, including augmented reality. And I'm a graduate of Harvard Kennedy School who studied public policy and completed a mini MBA at Harvard Business School. Um, our advisor, Dina Enos, is actually the former, former VP of Traffic Acquisition and Revenue Management at TripAdvisor. We talk extensively with her. In terms of uh, exit strategy, so we'd later explore options for uh, being acquired and just within the, after sort of five years, in about five years, but we're looking at Google who is interested in machine learning and people reliving memories and in 360 panoramic photos. Uh, Facebook is interested in computer vision and augmented reality, which are Pivot's underlying technologies. And um, we're talking to Smithsonian Enterprises who's interested in Pivot's integration of augmented reality and history as well. Google's oh. Um, this is really just like technology. It looks very cool. Um, but I wonder who cares. I, I take a tour. I care because I'm an old codger and I, I think about the past. But younger you people, I have that picture. I have that picture. Yeah, I was in that picture. <laughs> um, but um, do young people care about what what the history is uh, behind it? Now, now that's an excellent question, and uh, we have to give all the thanks to Magnus on his uh, product development and insights and nagging him to make it better. Um, now, parents care. Parents care to tell their children uh, the history that they once lived. And what we're really exploring is how to market it to parents, to give it to their children, uh, walk tours, 
Um, that's one way through the shoebox network. That's what we want to do. We want to engage the older generation with the younger generation. Um, I communicate with my parents now more online than I do any way, uh, any way else, mainly because I'm living far away from them. But every once in a while, I'll get an old picture sent. This is what college would look like. This is what um, you know what it looked like when we went to Disney World when you were five years old. Kind of that reminiscing, and this is kind of that engagement that we want to drive. Now, when it's on an institutional level, you know that it's vetted. You know that, like for instance, when we went uh, to Italy, you know we, we were wondering what, are, what is everything that we're looking at. If we could just point our device at it and get that information right away, and uh, you don't need 3G or uh, Wi-Fi to be connected to GPS. It can all be locally stored. Specifically with heritage tours, and just so I can add, it's actually the um, they, these heritage tourists or people who are looking to learn about the culture or history of a place, they spend more and they travel more often than other subset of tourists, and they actually use their mobile device to explore a place. But the information is very disparate. So if I want to learn about what the exact history of this place and really be immersive into its experience and the images of it and information pertaining to it. So I, I, we have more stats about that. So I understand what your product is doing is providing the pictures um, into someone else's historical description, or are you also creating this whole experience? So the institutions themselves will upload, so Harvard actually is uploading their content and providing the descriptions for that content. What our backend does is actually layer that according to GPS and to Compass, and later on we're looking at algorithms to basically sort and match these through image processing. So eventually, all these new companies that are coming out with Tour Boston, but what you would be doing is adding this software as a feature into what they are already doing, adding it as a service that they can provide, that and they can, can provide. They can and if you started having conversations with some, and Boston Dove Tours is one. Uh, okay. We're starting conversations. We our C, the CTO uh, contacted us right away when we connected with them, and they're very interested. So we're actually beta testing with us. Yeah, but Kickstarter was great. We got a lot of people funding, funneling in from all over the world. Minnesota has contacted us so many times. They have a, a city there, apparently, that's very old. Um, and also MIT Alumni Association. So a lot of people are kind of interested in what this service could provide for them. So if you consider these institutional-like organizations that you're going after as your go-to-market strategy, do you envision a future where you've essentially imaged the world and you make it more of a consumer-oriented uh, play as opposed to an institutionally-oriented play? We want to say we do. We're not tar we're, we're good. That's 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 the gold standard for us. And I want to say we're not going wide up more than we can chew right now. We want to build a big user base for sure. We want to be the Google Street View through history. That's what we want to do. And we we know that people have photos that they're that are withering withering away that can add to these institutional archives as well. And we know that these institutional archives are actually not being viewed. So Library of Congress, for instance, they get about you know. 20 to 50 times as many views when, when their photos are actually on Flickr rather than in a very archaic database in their website. And uh, it would be cool to take a Wikipedia approach to, to that. So, that's what should so there is a competitor. So augmented reality had, is kind of going through these ebbs and flows. And the first presenter did an excellent job describing uh, AR. Um, now, you know, there was a bubble, and now it's coming back because of the investments in Magic Leap and so on. Um, now, the Wikipedia approach is interesting to just make everything Wikipedia augmented reality, um, but you have to do the 80-20 rule. You have to find 20% of those locations that will get you 80% of the reward. That's what our uh, investor, Fadi Hamdoua, was interested mainly for Syria and Iraq and Palestine, all these places that are being kind of destroyed on a daily basis. Um, but when he said, bring it, bring it to the United States, what are those, what is the 20% of locations that will bring you 80% of the return? So in kind of layman's terms, what are the pivotal points that we have to find and make them into uh, pivot points 